So in the neighborhood I grew up, up the street, there was a, a family that had eight or nine kids, and the youngest had never stayed by himself. He was a boy until he was 16 years old, and he decided the first night that he was ever going to be in his house by himself all night, he was going to watch a scary movie, and that scary movie was The Exorcist. Now, I've never seen this movie. I don't recommend that you watch it. It's an awful movie, but not a smart move on his part. He watched the movie, and little did he know that during that movie, one of his older brothers came in, saw what was going on, realized that his brother, watching the movie, his little brother, didn't know he was there in the house, went upstairs to his room and waited for him, and not just waited for him there, but he was climbed under his bed and was there, and when Chad came up to get into bed, realized that when his bed started shaking, realized that when he got up to run out of the room out of fear, his brother didn't just let it go there, but he grabbed his ankles and literally pulled him under the bed. I can't, I can't imagine either still being alive if I was the brother under the bed, because it would just have... <laughs> it's surprising that nobody died, either from fear or retribution, well, but they're both alive today, to, for the record. To talk about it. But we are on the topic of fear, and since Jeff brought up a, a scary movie, I, in my mind, scary movies are not one that I enjoy watching. I, it's not, when I go out to the movies and I pick a movie, that is like the last thing on my list that I look for. But yet, when we were hanging out as a group of guys, we were celebrating somebody's... Uh, upcoming wedding we decided to go see a movie and unbeknownst to many of us in the the crowd this movie was a scary movie a movie on the fear of the darkness the the shadows that that are around us when the lights are out and so we did not know this i was sitting there thinking it was just going to be one of those uh movies that are scary because it just is more suspenseful but uh, within the first three minutes, I was like, I don't like this. This is not good. This is I do not want to be here. And I remember going through the movie, freaking out. But it was more the response after the movie because I knew I had to go home where the house was going to be dark. My wife was already in bed because it was after like 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And I, I remember still texting her to wake her up and say, could you leave the lights on? Because I did not want to walk through the house dark (laughs) and it's a it's crazy what movies and shows that are that play on fear what it does to our minds and how i can walk into a house nine out of ten times not even think about it but after watching a scary movie all of a sudden every single shadow looks like some creepy thing lurking for my life and i'll have to admit when i was a kid one of my most scary times was when i the space between turning off the light in my bedroom and then getting in bed at night. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I would do like a little like 10 yard dash, you know, you hit the switch and then you run and jump in your bed and hope high knees, nothing gets you in between exactly high knees. Yeah. So we're talking about fear today and how it affects students. I'm Jeff Eckert. I'm Jason Brewer. And this is the Thought Factory. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, cultivating students through biblical discipleship and spiritual disciplines using theology, community, and technology. Learn more at neverthesame.org. Well, we are in season two of the Thought Factory, and so first we wanted to thank everyone for the response from season one. It's been great to just hear the responses and see how how leaders and adults and parents and students even have acknowledged what they are getting from our podcast. And so we appreciate your involvement. We've heard a lot from you, and we're just encouraged by by your interest. And if you enjoy this podcast, just give us a, a positive review. Give us some love. You know, you can go on iTunes, give us some some reviews. You can uh, let other people know. And so we've we've actually started season two a little bit later than what we were anticipating because we are both in the hospital at the same time for two different reasons, uh, not related, but we we were in the hospital and we were out for quite a while. Me with pneumonia and sepsis and you decided to have a surgery somewhere. Yeah, I know. It's uh, one of those things that kind of happened. We wanted to come back earlier, but we're glad to be here. We're glad we're both standing. We're fine. We're healthy. Back to normal. Yep. So we're looking ahead to the next episode. Between now and our next recording, we are hosting students from across the United States for our Claim Your Campus National Student Council Forum. And we will be talking about where students spend the majority of their lives. 
which is in the school. And we're going to discover what really goes on behind the walls of our school campuses and how students feel about their school. So we're really excited. Yeah, it's going to be great. We're looking forward to hanging out with those students and then hearing from them and sharing some of their thoughts in this podcast. And this season, if you you, uh, listen to season one at all, you'll know that we based it around some research that we did last summer in the summer of 2016. And that guided a lot of our content and what we wanted to do. And this season will be based a lot around that content as well. We will have guests like we did last season. But just just to recap, in case you didn't know, first of all, we'd encourage you to go back and listen to season one. But we surveyed and researched around 3,000 students and about 500 adults all across the United States. Many of these would be connected to local churches somewhere, churches of all different kinds and sizes, and from different places around the country, rural, urban, suburban. And we asked them a series of questions, and then we asked their adult leaders the same questions, but asked them to try to answer them the way they thought their students would. And we've come up with some interesting differences and similarities in that research and seeing what adults think students are thinking as opposed to what students are thinking themselves. So this season, as we get into it, we're going to be going with the same type of idea, and talking about what students are thinking and what adults are thinking as well. So as Jason mentioned, we're going to be talking about fear today, and let's look at a few questions that we ask students. First of all, we ask them, how often are you afraid? And 42% said they're either fearful several times a day or daily, which to me seems like a lot. 42% are saying we're experiencing fear either several times a day or definitely on a daily basis. Now, several times a day, about 16% of students said they experience it several times a day, and 26% said daily. So when you combine those two, several times a day or daily, 42%, and that's a lot. And then less than 1% said that they're rarely ever afraid. Now, this jumped out to us because of all the research we did. This is about the lowest response of any question that we saw in our research. So we think that that was significant enough to, to mention and the fact that, that students are aware that fear is something they're experiencing and they're aware of that. And so we, we think that's worth talking about, the fact that they know that fear exists in their life, but a lot of times they can know things like all of us, but are, are you self-aware of it? And they seem to be pretty aware of fear. And one of the questions that we're asking is, what are they afraid of? You know, when you are looking at the stat of a daily occurrence of fear in a student's life, what is making them afraid? What is causing them to to go through daily life and having this sense of fear? And and so we ask that question, what are students afraid? What environment causes the most anxiety or or fear? And and we came with 71% told us that school was the cause of fear. And then 20% was the home and then 9% was work. And so we we have this environment of school where they spend the majority of their time uh, in and, and yet they have this fear at school. And for Christian students, it's, it's not just the fear of what others think, it's not being sure of how to even represent their faith. And so they're, they're telling us that whether it's a public school, a private school, a Christian school, it's there is a, a a large percentage that are saying school causes fear. Now, as we'll get into next week when we're talking about school, one of the things that, that really was surprising, for me at least, is that students, they talk about what causes that fear. And we're not going to get into that much today, but we asked them, is it, for for a Christian student at a school, is it uh, representing their faith? Is it being a Christian? Is it standing out? And what they're telling us is that it's not really standing out as much as it is not being sure how to represent their faith accurately. But, you know, thinking back to school, thinking back to what our experiences and your experiences, and in all the thousands of students that we connect with and the students that we know, there's different little rules or things that may cause fear that are different at schools in different environments. And for me, dropping your tray at lunch was a huge deal. And if you dropped your tray, everything stopped and you got a standing ovation. And it became my goal in high school to never drop my tray. I made it through ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 
then going into 12th grade, cruising home. It was right, I mean, I think it was like a few weeks before graduating high school, I did it. I dropped the tray and got the standing O, and it was humiliating, especially to be a senior. And then I remember other times where I really got serious about my faith before my freshman year, and and it was really tough for me that year, especially in the next year, ninth and 10th grade, to be a believer and to feel like I wanted to represent my faith in a way that was appropriate, not in your face or anything. But I got made fun of by my friends. I lost some friendships because of that. But I know that that, that I, I experienced a lot of anxiety being a Christian at school. In fact, for a while, I made a commitment to carry a Bible with me at school and to try to read it as much as I could. And I did it in a way to kind of show people, hopefully not like in a, a proud or braggadocious way, but to let them know who I was as a Christian. And so I made a commitment to carry it on the outside of my books. I didn't carry a book bag, and that was the way. But I, I can tell you, as a person that was really shy in high school, it took guts for me to do that every day. And I and I had that fear and that anxiety kind of welping me as I put that Bible out outside of my books and carried it and saw people look at it and felt really strange, but at the same time knew and felt for me like that was the right thing to do. For me, in middle school, I think the fear was uh, getting beat up by girls or <laughs> anyone in general because girls were much taller than me, and and I was not a very large uh, kid. I was the uh, under five foot scraggly kid that was scrappy, and and uh, I remember one time I I said something to a girl who I think was seven foot eight inches tall in um, seventh at, grade. In probably. seventh grade. Um, I'm, I, th- I mean, that's an approximate, uh, height, but I'm pretty sure she was about that tall. I, I made fun of her name of how she spelled it and she didn't even hesitate and she grabbed me and, uh, proceeded to dump me into the trash can, folded me in half and put me in the trash can where I was now stuck licking my knees. And so, uh, that you made kinda... fun of her name, which she couldn't even control. Exactly. But you don't need two R's in your name when your name is star. So, uh, oh. I just, I was like, it's repetitive. It's, it's unnecessary. You're not saying star rar. And so that just kind of came out. And, uh, I think she had enough of my little scrappiness. And so that, that kind of projected my fear of, uh, tall women in my life at a middle school age. And then high school, part of my fear was always coming from, being smaller than everybody else. And so I think it was more like it developed my humor or it developed my my quick comeback and wit so that if somebody had an issue with me, even as a Christian, it was something that I developed a, a comeback system that I could destroy anybody it, with words. And I think that all came out of fear of not wanting to either look bad or be treated poorly or made fun of or get dumped in a trash can. And so I remember times in, in middle school and high school where I operated out of this fear, but it, it caused me to to be proactive in how I was going to react to people. And now as adults, I think I look back and you maybe feel the same way, but you realize you may have felt like me in saying, I'm probably the only one that's really dealing with fear or anxiety about what other people think of me. And that is a, obviously a very common thing that students think about. So we ask them how often they're afraid and where they're afraid, what environments. And then we ask them what they're afraid of. So a couple things here. 31%, one in three students are saying abandonment is something that is on their mind and what they're afraid of. And then loneliness is another thing at 28%. Not far apart in statistics. 31% abandonment, 28% loneliness. There is a fear of abandonment with students in what they're dealing with. And this seems to be really prevalent in our culture, this abandonment that students are experiencing. Yeah, I would say this is a topic that we can look at it and go, what's going on and how can we we as youth leaders assist in the fear because one in three students in your ministry fear abandonment and fear of of being left out and and not having somebody to rely on and they are they're often re- abandoned from their their parents and so are we as youth workers youth leaders 
Are we providing as much stability as possible in their lives when they may have complete instability at home and it, it bleeds over into school? And as a work, youth worker, you may be the only one that's stable in their life and they can rely on you and count on you. And, and there is not this, it almost eases this fear of abandonment when they know every time I go into the church, so-and-so is going to be there. Every time I'm showing up at youth group, so-and-so is going to be there. The youth leader is going to be there. They're going to welcome me. They're going to invite me into their life. And so for professionals, quote unquote, professional youth workers, balance leading, but empowering adult leaders who most likely will outlast you in the student ministries at your church. I know for me, there's there's adult leaders that are still going strong at the, the local church that I served at. And I've been removed almost five years from now, and they're still going as adult leaders. And so they're pouring into youth and to students, and their involvement in their lives wasn't geared around one particular person or personality or anything like that. And so are we empowering these adult leaders to be involved with students in, in a deeper way where they are, are confirming that they are not going to leave them? Yeah, if you're in a, if you're in a church that has someone who's paid, and maybe you're listening to this and you're paid as a professional youth worker, youth pastor, whatever your title might be, I think it's important to really help your volunteers and your team of adult leaders understand how important their role is. I grew up in a very small church, never had a youth pastor, and had volunteers that led our youth ministry that was really strong and vibrant. And and to this day, I'm friends with those people. They've remained in my life, even though I live in a different state, in a different environment and community from where I grew up. And Jason, you mentioned that the last church I served in was 11 years. And some of the people that I served with as volunteers that were there are still there too. And and that's is really an amazing thing. And so for adult volunteers especially, but for all of us, just being there, being present every week, sometimes it can uh, be seem monotonous, and am I making a difference? And and I hear that a lot from volunteers where they think, am I really making a difference? And going back to what you said, the importance of continuity and presence in their lives matters so much. Just knowing that even if a student's not regular, maybe they might come every other time or whenever on a random basis, but when they show up, when they see your face there, it really does matter, and it means a lot to them, and I think that's huge. So having that stability and continuity is really big. And when it comes to loneliness, more than one in four of your students have a fear of loneliness. And when it comes to that particular fear, one of the things that Jason and I were talking about before we recorded is just this idea that are we really helping students understand the idea of the Holy Spirit in their lives? We've learned in the past couple summers as we've done research and in talking with youth workers across the country and students especially, that the the understanding of the Holy Spirit is, when it comes to the Trinity, it's mentioned in Scripture, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is the least understood. And Jesus talked about that. He introduces us to the concept of the Holy Spirit in the Gospels, and he says, as I go away, I'm going to send the Comforter, the Counselor. And I'm thinking that for students that feel lonely, I'm wondering how many of them might not totally understand that if they are a believer, they have the presence of God with them. And so in a sense, they're never by themselves, they're never alone. And that can add great comfort. I know it has for me in my life. And the more I've learned about the Holy Spirit, the more I've realized the comfort that He brings. And that might be a way to help students with loneliness. Now, obviously, that's not the only thing we can do, but maybe think about talking about the Holy Spirit and helping them understand what the Scriptures has to say so that they can understand the comfort and the presence of God in their lives. Yeah, we can be so focused on sharing who Jesus is and his life, and that's a great thing. And the connection to the Father and knowing the Father through Jesus, but we can tend to leave the Holy Spirit out and almost not really acknowledge the Holy Spirit. It is hard to describe. It's hard to explain. But when there's moments that you can just sense the Holy Spirit in the room, do you ever acknowledge the Holy Spirit or do you just kind of lead through it with almost reaping the benefits of the Holy Spirit in that room where you, you see students' lives are being changed, but you never acknowledge what's happening and who is, is guiding that? 
that moment. And that's the Holy Spirit. And so do we take those times to explain that the Holy Spirit is present at times when we gather as a community, but also in our our lives when we are away from community. And we can call upon the Holy Spirit to, to give us comfort and to give us peace and provide what we may need when we are feeling lonely. And one of the questions is, do we provide healthy community outside of the program? Do we provide times where these students can gather and feel a sense of, of healthy community where it's not just, hey, you're here for an hour and a half in this program and just observe and participate occasionally, but you are, you're intermingling with other students and other adults and you're hanging out late after the youth group or at a house party where they can, they can have community and connection where it's not through social media and a phone or a computer, but they are feeling like they are connected in a way that is really intended in relationships, is this uh, more intimate time where it's conversation and you can see each other's eyes and see that there's a care in people's eyes. And whether you're laughing or, or talking deep, I think moments outside of the program are so important. Well, hey, this is Ian from Celebrate Church out in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Just wanted to just kind of give my quick thoughts on NTS Camp, man. It has been an incredible camp experience for our students, and I know even not just for our students, but for our leaders that go as well. Um, just to see the life change that happens in those five days, four nights at camps, but how it actually transcends. Uh, not just that week, but just into the months and even just the year, how they get home and actually apply then what they've learned there to their life back home and uh, and, and take what they've learned through God's Word and just uh, incorporate that into their life, whether that home, whether that school, um, in our community. Uh, we've seen it just affect so many different things and even just uh, impacting the life of our church through them serving and just growing has just been amazing to hear the stories time and time and time again. What is the opposite of fear? Do you think it's having courage, bravery? Uh, tell me. It's faith. And faith and fear are polar bear opposites. And one pushes out the other. And God did not give us a spirit of fear. This fear that comes out of the world, from the world. Fear of missing out. The news that plays off of our fears. The social media aspect of of the fear and, and comparing ourselves to others and fearing of whether we're missing out or fear that we just don't match up. Culture of fear today is it drives many aspects of culture, the economy. It drives just all sorts of, of um, aspects of culture, but it also it, it affects the church, the body of Christ. We are driven by fear many times, and, and yet God doesn't give us a fear doesn't give us a spirit of fear or, or timidity, but we can have faith that drives out this fear. I, I've seen more and more in my own life, and I think God's helped me understand the fearfulness in me that he continues to, to try to drive out. And Jason, as you talk about that, it just seems like whenever you tune into any kind of media, whether it be social media, whether it be something like current events and the news, articles, things that talk about the future, even movies, everything seems to to come from a fearful perspective. And and I realized for me personally that God showed me more and more that passage that you mentioned, that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, a spirit of timidity, a spirit that shrinks back, but really anticipates and understands that the future can really be good, and there can be a, a lot of promise and hope. But if we fill our minds with everything that the world is giving us, it really, and you're saying, because because it really can be economic and, and it's driving force, there's a lot of money in fear. And because of that, we are surrounded by fear. And more and more, I think it's important for us in our role to help students confront that fear and then to comfort them and tell them that it's going to be okay because If we don't, it just seems like our natural bent, especially it seems like in our culture here, and we're talking about the United States, it seems like fear drives so many things, and we need to help students see that. We need to see it in ourselves and then help students see that so that we can really understand, like you're talking about how faith 
plays an important role in the opposite of fear in our lives. Yeah, and I said that that courage is not the opposite of fear, but faith is. But faith leads to courage. You can't have courage without faith leading the way, giving you some reassurance that you are are able to be courageous. And faith is built on a track record of past experiences. And this is key for us adult leaders to share with our students how God has been faithful to us throughout our lives. We can point to I know I can point to a various number of, of experiences with God that he he stepped in and reassured me that he was with me and and that I could have faith in him and not fear the situation that I may be in or fear what I am already conjuring up in my mind because I'm playing it out and going three days out, a week out, a month out and having this fear just occupy the the real estate of my mind. And God has said, no, no, I'm going to step in and remove this fear. And I have stepped in a number of times and I provided and I have given you the ability to have faith in me and I've come through. And so as adults, are we ex- are explaining these experiences that we have w- with God and sharing what how he has come through for us in the past. That's so powerful when you talk about that, because when you talk about that track record, and the longer that we walk with God and know him, the more faithful we understand that he is, especially over time. And we've all experienced ups and downs where we might be in a season, even right now, in a time in your life as you're listening to this, where things don't seem to be that great, and you wonder about God's presence and his faithfulness, but It's when we look back, and especially, again, over the longer the better, the longer that we've known God in our lives, the more we've understood how He's really been there and how He's walked through us, with us in the difficult times and the great times. And that track record you're talking about makes me think about Scripture. That's one of the powerful parts that we have in helping us understand God's faithfulness over a period of time to humanity and giving students that perspective, not only giving them like you talked about, a biblical perspective, but a personal one as well. So we can say, this is the God of Scripture, and He's been with His people throughout time. But let me tell you, as a, someone with more life experience to a student that we know, let me tell you about God's faithfulness in my own life and the track record that I have. And when there's often so many times in Scripture when God tells His people, look back and look at this time and remember this and maybe build some kind of even physical, tangible reminder. I think he was doing that because he was reminding them, I've been with you, and this, like you're saying, that faith from that will give us courage to go into the future without a spirit of fear, which is huge. Yeah, and I believe that when I am faced with a situation that I could easily be overcome with fear— I can have courage because of that track record. I can have courage because of how God has been with me all throughout those other times, and yet I still almost diminish Him because the fear can be so strong, and yet God reminds us, and if we aren't reminding ourselves through Scripture and what God has done in the past, then we can allow that fear to grow uncontrollably, and yet are we teaching students? Are we reminding them? Are we helping them grow in faith by confronting this fear with the truth of who God is and what He has done? So as we think back about this idea of fear today and students, what they're afraid of, where they feel this fear, and how often it comes up in their life, we've ended by talking about faith. And a great reminder for all of us is that when a student's faith grows, then that fear will automatically diminish in their life. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, whose vision is to see new generations transformed in Christ to further the kingdom of God. Learn more at neverthesame.org.